Am I saying that Rome was behind the War of Independence? You see all these Roman icons, the fasciae, the great seal with this Illuminati all-seeing eye. All these speak of, of a coming reunion with Rome that they were bringing about. Pope of the Holy See! To address this joint session of Congress directly to God. We can also agree on the need to stand up to anti-Catholic bias. And the great religious leaders here tonight give us all an example that we can follow. Well, welcome back to our Image to the Beast studies. I've titled this part two, American Crafters of Roman Imagery. Now we remember from last week that the beast from the earth, from Revelation 13, we saw it was the United States. We saw that the United States was a haven for the pilgrims, those persecuted ones that had fled the church state systems in, in continental Europe and in England. Both Catholic and Protestant church state systems were persecuting the faithful, those that desired to live according to their conscience as they understood the Bible and not according to the, the dictates of the church state systems they were bound up with. We saw that when finally the, the, they were granted religious liberty, the people of America, those pilgrims, um, and which was expressed in, that, uh, declar uh, in the Constitution, we also saw that a falling away has happened, that America has ceased to be good, like the original pioneers were, and that that will lead, and he's already starting to see, that it is speaking as a dragon. As the, as the prophecy says that the other beast would come up out of the earth, have two horns like a lamb, and then this, this contradiction in its nature that it spake as a dragon. It will become a persecutor of the oppressed, which is the exact thing that the people that founded America were running away from. And that, will, and that will culminate in the U.S. forming an image to the beast, which will be a church-state system like the beast that will persecute those who, um, who want to live by the word of God. We saw that he, he will exercise all the power that the papacy did, power over both the soul and the body. Now, the reality of the, of the United States is that the founding fathers... The ones that established it, that established the Constitution and all this, these uh, national symbols were Freemasons and Deists, almost exclusively. But at the same time, the United States and its Constitution and laws was ordered by God's providence. It, seems, it always has seemed a little bit contradictory to me. I want to unravel this mystery and see how this undeniable fact that of the, of the founders of America, how it lines up with the prophecies of Revelation 13 that we've been reading. And we're going to see that Rome hijacked the Protestant New World much earlier, earlier in the game than we might have thought. And we're also going to see how the United States is the image to the beast in a very tangible and visible way. This is what I'm getting at here from Rulers of Evil. Most histories of the American government skim over the Masonic presence. Americans like their history told in high-definition icons of good and evil, liberty and tyranny, heroism and treason, might and right. They won't buy a heritage polluted by dark spots of mystery. Yet the greater part of American governmental heritage is almost wholly mysterious. And indeed it is. Am I going to see that? And you can see there... The father of the nation, George Washington, in his Masonic apron, which represents the fig leaf uh, aprons that Adam and Eve wore to cover up the shame of their nakedness, standing over the black and white squares, the knowledge of good and evil. What is the occult doing setting up a state that was, you know, to liberate persecuted um, Christians? Anyway, we're going, to, we're going to get into that. We're going to see how Rome destroys th by peace, by quietness. She destroys openly, but also she, used, she uses subtlety. We saw that the papacy, was his power was mighty, but not by his own power. We saw last week how she employed 
uh, Belisarius and, and Charlemagne to subdue her enemies. The verse continues to say that through his policy, the papacy's policy, he also shall cause craft to prosper in his hand and shall magnify himself in his heart and by peace shall destroy many. And then after that, he shall stand up against the prince of princes and shall be broken without hand. So that word craft, it means fraud and deceit. It's not his own hand, it's it's in his hand. He employs it, it's people he employs. And that word by peace shall destroy many means by quietness. And to destroy means to craft. But so how did Rome destroy by peace? Can it be said that during the 1260 years of, of papal supremacy, Rome destroyed by peace? Was that her policy? No, it wasn't. It was a policy of open destruction. You see, with the Inquisition and the Spanish Armada that they, they tried to destroy Protestant Eng- England with, the Thirty Years' War. These were all open war that she was waging against Protestants. After that, during the deadly wounded stage between 1798 and in the time leading up to it, her policy changed to a policy of secret destruction. So by his policy, he shall cause craft to prosper and by peace, he shall corrupt many. During this deadly wounded stage, Rome, Rome did her most damaging work. She took occasion of the fact that her enemies perceived that she was, she was out of action and therefore had let their guard down. The, at this time, the Jesuits infiltrated Protestant nations, infiltrated their churches, their governments, financial systems, the corporate sectors, and turned, them, turned all these things back towards Rome. Now we read here, in this book called The Jesuits' Conspiracy. It says here, secret meetings overheard in the 1830s by Leone, a 19-year-old Jesuit novice who obviously blew the whistle. Listen to what the the Jesuits were uh, rejoicing about. This is what he overheard. Protestantism is already wearing out and is sinking to decay. Yes, we are destined to insult its last agonies, to march over its broken skeleton and scattered bones. Oh, let us hasten this dissolution by our strong and united efforts. Protestantism is becoming decomposed. It is falling to pieces. This apparently was in 1830. It actually sounds remarkably like the prophecies that says, By peace he shall destroy or corrupt many. It was during this time you can see they were rejoicing over the, over the decaying Protestantism. And indeed it was decaying at that time. For those that may not know, let's introduce the Jesuits to see who they were. They were started by a man called Ignatius of Loyola in the 1540s. They called themselves the Society of Jesus, but you see by that symbol there, they're, they're the sun symbol, that they're, they're a pagan sun-worshipping religion. And IHS, which is supposedly means in his service, but it really stands for Isis, Horus, and Set, the Egyptian deities, which goes right back to Babylon. So this is a Babylonian organization. Now, I'm going to read you a little bit from their oath, just so we understand how they, how they operate. Now, this oath that they take, they, uh, the, the, the initiate taking the oath, which is, it's not an oath taken by the, the lowest levels of Jesuits, but rather um, the higher levels only take this extreme oath. This is the extreme oath that they take as they get to higher levels. And they take this oath, kneeling down, with a clasp clasp a dagger over their heart that their superior is holding the the handle of. And then after they they speak the oath, some blood is taken from over their heart and they, they sign with their own blood. And this is how it goes. I furthermore promise and declare that I will, when opportunity presents, make and wage relentless war, secretly or openly, against all heretics, Protestants and liberals. Keep that in mind. The enemies of the Jesuits are Protestants and liberals. By liberals, they mean they may not be Protestants, they may be Catholics, but they believe in freedom. They do not believe in a church and state tyranny, which is a Catholic church is. As I am instructed to do, to extirpate and exterminate them from the face of the whole earth, and that I will spare neither age, sex, or condition, and that I will hang, burn, waste, boil, flay, strangle, and bury alive these infamous heretics rip up the stomachs and wombs of their women and crush their infants' heads against the walls in order to annihilate forever their 
execrable race. That when the same cannot be done openly, I will secretly use the poison cup, the strangulating cord, the steel of the poignard, or the leaden bullet, regardless of the honor, rank, dignity, or authority of the person or persons, whatever may be their condition in life, either public or private, as I at any time may be directed to do so by any agent of the Pope or superior of the Brotherhood of the Holy Faith of the Society of Jesus. And they call it the Society of Jesus after saying things like that. So you can see the um, absolutely scrupulous and wicked nature of this organization. <clears throat> this, these were the agents who, was, who were destroying by peace. As I said, they were organized at the beginning of the Reformation for the specific reason of destroying Protestants. They are their enemies, Protestants and liberals. They are a military order commanded by a military commander who is called the Jesuit general and otherwise known as the Black Pope. And he is more, actually more powerful than the White Pope. Ignatius Loyola, as we saw the picture there, he was the first Black Pope and there's been another one in succession ever since. Now I'm going to read a little bit from this book called The Art of War. The Art of War was apparently written by some ancient oriental wisdom by a man called Sun Tzu. It was translated, however, by a Jesuit priest called Joseph Marie Amiot, in, and it was published in 1772. Now, if you look up this Sun Tzu, he was actually a historically uncertain character. But what is certain, however, is that this Jesuit, Joseph Marie Amiot, was under orders from Lorenzo Ricci, the Jesuit general, and no doubt had taken the oath. So everything that these people do is for the furtherment of the Jesuit order, is in harmony with the Jesuit order. They don't just publish books for the education and, and adding of culture. They do things to further their plans. So what this book really is, is a way that the Jesuits put the truth out in plain sight. The occult world often communicates the truth to the world while at the same time deceiving you through other means, sort of their truth in plain sight, the way they operate. It's, and what this book outlines through this oriental wisdom is the modus operandi of the Jesuit order. And you'll see what I mean when I, when I read a little bit of it. There's Lorenzo Ricci, the picture there, that was the Jesuit general at the time of the release of this book. So we can, we can assume he is the author. And he writes, All warfare is based on deception. Hence, when we are able to attack, we must seem unable. When using our forces, we must appear inactive. When we are near, we must make the enemy believe we are far away. Remember in the, in the wounded stage? When far away, we must make him believe we are near. Appear weak when you are strong and strong when you are weak. The supreme art of war is to subdue the enemy without fighting. Just compare that with the, with the Daniel 8.25 there. By his policy, he shall cause craft or deceit. All warfare is based on deception. And there in the, in the red, by peace ye shall destroy many, appear weak when you are strong. And then it says there, the, the supreme art of war is to subdue the enemy without fighting. They're telling us this is the way they were operating. And this is exactly how they subdued their enemies, Protestants. Remember, their enemies were Protestants and liberals. And they did it through peace or quietness. And how did they do it? How did they subdue with their enemies without fighting? They infiltrated the, the enemy, enemy nations and got them to destroy each other. They got them to destroy each other. They didn't need to fight. They got them to, to fight amongst themselves. Divide and conquer, another motto of, of the Jesuits. So, from the 17th century onwards, and even a bit earlier, the English-speaking world was the stronghold of Protestantism. The Pope of Rome had failed to subdue England through conventional methods, like we saw with the Spanish Armada. She tried to get Mary, they tried to get Mary, Queen of Scots, in there, but she was ratted out and executed. They had their Douay Rams Bible that flopped by the, you know, superior scholarship of the, of the supporters of the King James, they hadn't been able to, to, to subdue England. Another problem with England was that the English church had said that the kings of England ruled by divine right. As we see here, this is William Blackstone. He was a political um, commentator, at least, in the time leading up to the War of Independence. He said that the king can do no wrong. 
is necessary and a fundamental principle of the English constitution. When a Protestant king was, was in power in England, he had zero tolerance for Romanism. As we saw, Elizabeth I, she executed Catholics. James I did the same, the ones that were threatening them. And England and her colonies, like America, were Rome's greatest enemies. And the, another problem was that they loathed Romanism. They wouldn't, Romanism couldn't infiltrate very easily in there. So how did they, how did they infiltrate and, and destroy these Protestant nations? Through Freemasonry, which is quite a simple and logical step, really. From this The Grand Design book, it says, The truth is the Jesuits of Rome have perfected Freemasonry to be their most magnificent and effective tool, accomplishing their purposes among Protestants. What Freemasonry did, Freemasonry was, was, was started by the Jesuits, not that they knew that, but they gathered up the dissenters against Rome, usually the aristocratic classes, and then they got them together in their secret club where they were able to freely criticize Rome and, you know, this was sort of, you know, uh, promoted within their, ser their, their circles. But at the same time, they were initiated into the same mysteries, the same Babylonian mysteries that Rome was. It was just another way of, you know, uh, indoctrinating the aristocracy with, into the occult, just like Roman Catholicism does. Another aspect of the Freemasons was that the highest master of a Masonic lodge received commandments from an unknown superior, a superior whose will the masters struggle up the degrees had trained him to obey without question. What the masters never realized was that this mysterious personage was in fact none other than the Black Pope. As we, we saw there, the Jesuit general. As Sun Tzu wrote, or as Lorenzo Ricci wrote, your enemies will serve you without their wishes or even their knowledge. This is how, how Rome's enemies, England and America, served Rome through Freemasonry without even, without even their knowledge. So, we're not, so I'm not saying that George Washington had a full knowledge of what he was up to or these other Freemasons in the American founding fathers. But by being part of this Freemasonry, they were under the control of Rome. So what was the state of affairs in the American colonies leading up to the War of Independence? As you can see there by the chart, the um, United States was a very profitable, profitable enterprise. They were producing lumber and minerals and meat, exporting them to other parts of the British Empire. And the colonists were very content. And as far as England was concerned, America was the goose that laid the golden egg. Prior to Lorenzo Ricci's ascension to the Black Papacy in 1758, the colonists had been blissfully loyal to the mother country. Looking back on the pre-Rician years, while testifying before the House of Commons in 1766, Benjamin Franklin recalled that the colonists were governed by England at the expense of only a little pen, ink and paper. They were led by a thread. So what changed? Both parties were, were very happy with the situation. You can see there the pre-Rician years, Lorenzo, once Lorenzo Ricci came in, it all changed. The Jesuit general, the crafty Jesuit general. England uh, muddied the waters by a series of abuses and excessive taxation, which led to high tensions. What monarch in their right mind would jeopardize such a productive endeavor? Now, King George had a prime minister called John Stuart, the Earl of Butte. He was actually a Freemason. And he was quite an incompetent monarch. And this man was the king's mentor. He actually ra basically raised him. So remember, we saw Freemasonry. Was the Freemasons, in their struggle up the degrees, took orders from an unknown superior. Ultimately, they were under the direction of the Black Pope. So... John Stuart was, was doing all these outrageous things that, that, that England hated him for after he left and the Americans hated him for. What, what gain would he have from it? He died a very unpopular man. He was taking orders from the Black Pope. He ruined the goose that laid the golden egg. So you have the Earl of Butte on one side influencing the king, tying up England and all these things that were making them unable to 
fight a very good war against America when it came to it. And then you had the other Freemasons like Benjamin Franklin and the other ones in America expressing outrage towards these things, but both of them were Freemasons and didn't realize who they were taking orders from, whether they understood what they were doing or not. This is from the extreme oath of the Jesuits. Take note, the Freemasonry works the same way. To take sides with the combatants to act secretly in concert with your brother Jesuit who might be engaged on the other side, but openly opposed to that with which you might be connected, only that the church might be the gainer in the end. Can you see how they work here? They're just stirring up tension on both sides. That's exactly what was happening here. Now the straw that broke the camel's back that basically ended in the War of Independence was the Boston Tea Party. This is from um, Encyclopedia Britannica. Boston Tea Party in 1773, an incident which 342 chests of tea belonging to the British East India Company, which was a Jesuit-controlled company, by the way. That's where the American flag comes to as well, um, incidentally. Were thrown from ships into Boston Harbor by American patriots disguised as Mohawk Indians. The Americans were protesting both attacks on tea and the perceived monopoly of the East India Company. The East India Company was trying to flood the market with cheap tea and the American traders were, were upset with that. And, but remember, the East Indian Company was controlled by the Jesuits, so the whole thing was um, just a bit of a, a big theatre. But who were these patriots that, that did the deed of throwing the tea? This is from a Masonic source. He says, Masons played an important part in the formation of the United States, and especially in the Revolutionary War and the events that led up to this war. It is commonly believed that the lodge rooms of the, a Boston Masonic Lodge served as a dressing room for the so-called Indians who threw the Boston Tea Party. So you can you see how the Freemasons are the agent provocateurs of the of the war, throwing the Tea Party, imposing the taxes. It was all it was all set up to happen as the way it did. I got so after this, the result was the Protestants wasted each other by the thousands, twenty five thousand being killed. Um, their enemies were serving Rome without their knowledge, and Rome was the ultimate winner in the end. Um, I'm going to understand why. It might, might seem a bit, con bit, bit confusing at the moment, but I'll tie it all together soon. And remember, another thing that, that Lorenzo Ricci said, the general sees all, hears all, does all, and in appearance is not involved with anything. The general will know how to shape at will not only the army he is commanding, but also that of his enemies. So am I saying that the Rome was behind the War of Independence? I mean... Oh, absolutely. You know, there's, there's no doubt about that. The fact that the Freemasons were, were fomenting the thing from both sides should, should ask a lot of, should raise a lot of eyebrows. But why would Rome want America to be independent from England? Why would they oversee the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution? Remember, these were written by these, these same agents. Well, why would they be, um, Rome be, be um, approve of such things? Because she had to be if, 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 if her agents, the Freemasons, were actually the ones doing them. Aren't the, the First Amendment that we read here, that Congress shall make law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise of, isn't that good? It is good. What about from this next part I'm reading? No religious test shall ever be required as a qualification to any office or public trust in the United States. Isn't that good also? In Europe and in England, because religious people sat in, in, the, in, the, in the government and they were the ones who were pushing for religious laws. So, you know, these things gave freedom to the people of America. <clears throat> and, and, and as I said in the previous study, they were a heritage given to those pilgrims that fled, um, that fled from, from persecution in, in their mother countries. But f remember, freedom works to, is a two-way street. Both the good and the bad are given free range when they have more freedom from the government. Can you understand how these things, although they're, they're good, and, and I believe God, Providence, ordered them to, to, to write these things, can also work in Rome's favour. Therefore, Rome could be, could be in, approval, in, in, a, in approval of them, even though Rome said things like the Constitution is a satanic document. that They say all these sorts of things. There's all, there's all sorts of intrigue going on. But, but can you see how they work? They can work in her favour. They eliminated the problem of Protestant monarchs denying, denying um, Catholicism in their country. They unrestrained Rome's influence that was, that was then now able to corrupt 
and um, do a work. Now, God's hand was in this overall. USA was the nation God chose to rise up many people who, who brought forth truth, such as William Miller and the Advent movement. It had to be have free religious liberty like we're seeing here in order for those things to be able to go forward. Without these things, that it would have been like they would have been restricted. They needed relaxed laws and religious liberty. And that's why how God's providence was overseeing it all. But it, like I said, it also gave the mystery of iniquity free range in Protestant America. And they knew that they could do away with it um, when their work of corruption was done. So the so the grand the grand plan that I'm going to hopefully try and bring out more is that Rome chose USA to be their image before the War of Independence and they set it up from, the, from that time to, to, to be the image of the beast. And far from removing the validity of our position on Revelation 13 and the image of the beast, it actually strengthens it. And bear with me and I'm going to, I'm going to um, explain that. Now the founding fathers of America were not conservative, pious Christian men. Most, if not all of them, were not Christians at all. This is just the reality. Um, they were not atheists. They believed in God. They were largely deists. George Washington was a deist and a Freemason. Benjamin Franklin was also a Freemason. Thomas Jefferson was a, a Unitarian, which is kind of, a, kind of like a deist. If you just look through all of them, they do not speak like Christian men. Their beliefs were, were removed from that. For example... Thomas Jefferson says, I trust there is not a young man now living in the United States who would not die a Unitarian. Now, it seems to suggest that that's what he wants to happen. They're converting the America to this, this philosophy that they were, they were part of. Here's some definitions of those things. Unitarianism. Unitarianism is an open-minded, individualistic approach to religion that gives scope for a very wide range of beliefs and doubts. So it's kind of a deism. Humanism. Devotion to the humanities, literary culture, the revival of classical letters. This is talking about Roman and Greek mythology, which we're going to show that this was the ideology behind that they inculcated into their monuments and into the people. Individualistic and critical spirit, an emphasis on secular concerns, characteristic of the Renaissance. Now, there's degrees of humanism. There's a secular humanism, which is more atheistic, but humanism doesn't have to be entirely atheistic. Deism. Belief in the existence of God, of a God, on the evidence of reason and nature only, with rejection of supernatural revelation. Rejection of the Bible. I'm not saying that they were opposed to the Bible, but this is the way they thought, which was common among the aristocratic classes that they were part of. Thomas Paine was actually among them too, by the way. We know what he was up to. Now, deism is very much like Freemasonry. Um, here's a, the words of Albert Pike. That which we must say to the crowd is... This is from Morals and Dogma, his um, famous book that has been exposed. That which we may say to the crowd is, we worship a God. It is the God one adores without superstition. It sounds very similar to that definition, doesn't it? The existence of a God with the rejection of supernatural revelation. It's a deism. To you, Sovereign Grand Inspector General, we say this, and you may repeat it, to the brethren of the 32nd, 31st and 30th degrees, the Masonic religion should be, by all of us initiates of the high degrees, maintained in the purity of the Luciferian doctrine. Yes, Lucifer is God. So deism, in reality, is a new way of packaging pagan religions. And Freemasonry is a pagan religion. It is the mystery religion of Babylon. And that's what these, these men were into, by and large. I can't speak for all of them, but you can certainly see with, with um, George Washington and Thomas Jefferson that that is the case. The American Revolutionary War, the, 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 the revolutionaries, they won some great victories, amazing victories over British that, well, that, was, that brought about the birth of the nation. And, you know, they actually commemorate, you can see they commemorated that in their symbols. And you can see that it is certainly not a very Christian way of commemorating um, their victories. This is the Great Seal. It was set up in 1782. And the designer was a man called Charles Thompson. You can tell he was very much a, an illuminated one. Now, this is the, from the words of another Freemason, Manly P. Hall. 
When the human race learns to read the language of symbolism, a great veil will fall from the eyes of men because it's been placed all around us. And all we have to do is take a look at it and, and you can be undeceived of what they're, they're doing and telling you. So you see the phrase there, Anuit Coeptus, and the Novo Ordo Seclorum, New World Order, and there's another one in the Eagle's Beak called Publius Unum or something. All these are Roman myths. They're from Roman, Roman poems. But the, the motto of the U.S. is Anuit Coeptus. Let's just see where that comes from. America's national motto, Anuit Coeptus, came from a prayer to Jupiter. It appears in Book 9 of Virgil's epic propaganda, the Aenid, a poem commissioned just before the birth of Christ by Caius Macinus, the multi-billionaire power behind Caesar Augustus. The poem's objective was to fashion Rome into an imperial monarchy for which its citizens would gladly sacrifice their lives. Does that sound um, fitting for what these men are, are doing here in America? Okay, continue. The scene is a battleground. The Trojans are outnumbered and fearful. Young Julius Ascanius takes a position on the front of his shrinking countrymen. He looks up at an evil giant named Remulus, king of the Rutulus. Remulus mocks the Trojans for sending a boy to fight him. Does it sound familiar? While the giant quakes with derisive laughter, Julius slips an arrow into his bowstring and cries toward the heavens, Almighty Jupiter, favour this rebellious undertaking, which is where you get Anuit Kerptus from. Each year I shall bring to thy temple gifts in my own hands and place a white bullock at thy altar. By the way, this is the official line of where this line comes from. This isn't just some far out thing. Jupiter then hisses an arrow from the sky that strikes Remulus in the head with such force that it passes clean through his temples. The Trojans raise a cheer and laugh aloud. Their hearts rise toward the stars. Apollo from his throne of cloud shouts the Gnostic credo. By striving so, men reach the stars, dear son of gods and sire of gods to come. So why would the founding fathers of a Christian nation, the, the large body are Christian, why would they choose a pagan ripoff of a biblical story for their national motto? Why not use the phrase from 1 Samuel 17, 47, when David was fighting Goliath and say, All this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give it into your hands. Why didn't they say, for the battle is the Lord's? They could have used that. Because the purpose of them, the aim, was to corrupt the Christian values. This, this mystery Babylon religion is the antithesis of Christianity. They wanted to imbue the population with pagan philosophy. That's what they were up to, obviously. Now, now remember he says Jupiter favoured this rebellious undertaking. Who is Jupiter? Jupiter, the Roman god. The chief ancient Roman and Italian god, like Zeus, the Greek god with whom he was identical. One of his ancient epithets is Lucetius, the light bringer. Not much imagination need to, to see who that is. So... The god that they commemorated the victory over England, these founding fathers, was the chief god of Rome, Jupiter or Lucetius or Lucifer. Jupiter is worshipped at the Vatican. We find that a tangible form of Zeus or Jupiter worship exists in the present day. It is commonly known and it is also told by the guides of the Vatican that the bronze statue of St. Peter in St. Peter's Basilica in Rome is the ancient pagan image of Jupiter, which was adopted, canonised and sanctified. This same image is being reverenced and his one big toe regularly kissed at certain ceremonies. So the God inside the Vatican is Jupiter. The Vatican is a temple of Jupiter. And remember in the tabernacle in the wilderness and also the one they built in Jerusalem, when you entered the sanctuary, you were always facing west towards the Shekinah glory where God was. Pagan temples have been orientated the exact opposite of that. You see, from St. Peter's there, St. Peter's Basilica, when the Pope looks towards the, the obelisk, which is where the, the sun god resides, you can see the sun rays coming out of it, he's facing east, which is exactly what we read in Ezekiel. It's a sign of sun worship and rebellion to God. In this vision, he says, And he brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house, and behold, at the door of the temple of the Lord's of the Lord, between the porch and the altar were about five and twenty men with their backs toward the temple of the Lord and their faces toward the east and they worshipped the sun towards the east. Just like we see there in the image of the Vatican, they're worshipping the sun, it's the pillar of the sun, that obelisk facing east from the, the temple. 
this is going to be relevant as we go on, so just keep this in mind. Sun worship worships towards the east, and the Vatican is orientated that way. So after the victory against the English, they set up a, another temple to Jupiter, and that is the Capitol building. This is the George Washington in his Masonic regalia, with surrounded by other Freemasons with their aprons on, commemorating the covering up of the shame, laying the cornerstone to the Capitol building. After that, they had a barbecue where, wherein a 500-pound ox was roasted. As I remember here, sounds a lot like the poem, each year I shall bring to the temple gifts in my own hands and place a white bullock at the altar. But why is it called Capitol Hill? Where's this name come from? In Rome, the Temple of Jupiter was built on Capitoline Hill. This article from Wikipedia says, The hill was early known as Mons Saturnius, dedicated to the god Saturn. The word Capitolium first meant Temple of Jupiter, later built here, and afterwards it was used for the whole hill. The word Capitol Hill comes from Capitoline Hill in Rome. And just compare the architecture there. On the left is an artist's impression of Capitoline Hill, the pagan temple in Rome, and on the right you've got the Temple of Jupiter in Washington, D.C., Capitol Hill. Can you see the striking resemblance it bears? Incidentally, the land that it was built on was donated by a Catholic family or sold by a Catholic family. And um, John Carroll was a Jesuit. He was one of the members of this family. The land was called Rome a couple hundred years before it was given to, to become the site of the capital. So all these, these amazing um, connections we're finding here. More about this building. Right on top, there's a statue that they named Freedom. Uh, this was placed there in Abraham Lincoln's time during the Civil War. It was sculptured in Rome. And wh who this is, is the Greek goddess Perisphone, who the Catholics call Mary. Now look at under her feet there, under the globe she's standing on. You see 12 Roman fasces or fasciae. They're a symbol of Roman totalitarianism. We see that in the center at the bottom. There's, a, there's an image from the French Revolution picturing the fasciae also. We can see that clearly the... Um, the same parties were involved in both, were behind both. They're a symbol of fascism, right? So from this Jesuit periodical, it says, Fascism is the regime that corresponds most closely to the concept of the Church of Rome. Again, Roman symbolism. It was a symbol widely used in the Roman Empire, and it consists of rods bound together around an axe. The axe is the origin of the term Axis powers for the fascist countries in the Second World War. And you can see on the left there, the fascist symbols on a stamp in Nazi Germany, and also the eagle, which the American uh, founding fathers also chose as their mascot. The symbolism of, is of people and countries bound together under a common centralized dictatorship, the axe. We're going to find out who the axe represents in a moment. During times of emergencies, when the Roman Republic declared a dictatorship, lictors, the bodyguard to a magistrate, attending to the dictator, kept the axe blades even inside the pomerium, a sign that the dictator had the ultimate power in his own hands. And notice there on the Supreme Court building, the two bodyguards behind the, the dictator with their fasci eye with axe in the pomerium. See, these things were put there very early on. Why would they choose such architecture, put such symbolism in their architecture? The only explanation is you know, what we're going to get to in a minute. And what, I've been, what we've been discussing. And here we see it inside Congress, two fasci beside the president. What did the fasci mean? All power under one man, one dictator, was surrounded by the, the people protecting him. And who was this one man that all power is under that they're symbolizing? Certainly not the United States president. From history of the Jesuits, this is a quote that Jesuit general said, See my Lord from this room, from this room, I govern not only Paris, but China, not only China, but the whole world, without anyone knowing how it is managed, Jesuit Superior General said to the Duke of Brancas in 1720. The axe represents the Black Pope. This is the occult symbol that was hidden there by the people that placed those occult symbols there, that the Jesuit General is the dictator. He is the one man that they are bringing the world into submission to. The general sees all, hears all, and does all, and in appearance is not involved with anything. Now, it's very significant the date he said that too, 1772. 
in the thick of all of this foment that was happening. Very clever. Rome established herself in the American government at the Declaration of Independence by their Freemason agents that we talked about. The philosophy they imbibed in the people, which was the, anti was the antithesis of Christianity, to erode away Protestantism, to serve as a propaganda to get the people to willingly sacrifice their lives, which we see happen a lot after that in all the wars and everything they've been involved in, this, this philosophy, this propaganda. You know, you know like I believe, in, I believe in, you know, serving my country and doing well to my society, but patriotism that, that people believe in is the motivation that they, they use to get people to go and fight all, in all their stupid wars. To go and kill other countries, that have, you know, for, which are always for unrighteous reasons or something, something to do with greed. Like, look at all the wars we've been involved in the 20th century. The external reason was we're going to fight the Nazis and all this stuff. But the real reasons for it were not what they tell us. But the, the drive is that patriotism, distorted patriotism. It's not Christian, you know. Anyway, and this comes from all these sorts of propaganda, this, this weaning away from the Bible principles. Jesus says, thou shalt not kill. You know, he, he says, my kingdom is not of this world. He doesn't say, go and, you know, fight for your, your nation, you know. Anyway, so all these, this philosophy is eroded away. Protestant values that those pilgrims brought with them from the lands. They, didn't, they weren't fighting for the country. They were fighting for God's kingdom, which was a spiritual war. These laws, the laws that they enacted, while they allowed freedom for, for the faithful, like we talked about, they also allowed the influence of, of, um, of the you know, enemies, the Jesuits, to control the government and, and, and um, churches and such. They allowed infiltration. Um, and the founding fathers, whether they knew it or not, were facilitating that. So the papacy had chosen USA to be their military arm that she was to use to enforce her her dictatorship, which she symbolized by the fasci. And this wasn't going to happen overnight. She first had to infiltrate, destroy the churches and turn the, win the people off their, their you know, pious Christian beliefs. And she used humanism and all these sorts of things I was talking about to set up this, this trinity of globalist control, this Babylonian control over the world. The spiritual power center in this trinity is, is the Vatican. The financial center is the city of London and Washington, D.C. Was, is the military hub of power. And all these are separate states completely independent of their respective countries. So this was the goal, and we see it was a well-laid plan. What we've been talking about regarding the, the beast from the earth and how I've been saying all these things that, you know, talking about how the founding fathers were, were not, in fact, um, Christians and how the, the things that they were doing were actually working in favor of Rome. Does that contradict the prophecy that we've been talking about? It sounds, it's, it, it sounds like it could. You know, I can understand how people might think that way. But we have to remember from the beginning, when the first beast was introduced, it has a dual nature. It has a contradiction in its nature from the beginning. We read here, And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. Now we understand that it transformed its nature, and it did. As it went along, it, its nature was transforming and is becoming more and more dragon-like. But these contradictions existed in the beginning. Lambs do not rebel against the government and kill and go to war like they did in the War of Independence. That is not a lamb-like trait, you know. These contradictions existed from the beginning. And far from being a contradiction or somehow weakening the prophecy, this actually gives more evidence for it, and I'm going to explain how. According to ex-Jesuit priest Alberto Rivera, all the mainstream churches were taken over by 1980. Now, this Alberto Rivera was a Jesuit from the time he was about five years old, and his job was to infiltrate and corrupt churches. And later on in life, he, 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 he saw the light he exposed, and, he became, and he started to expose them, and he, was, he died a mysterious death. Anyway, this is some of the things that were published from his information. And notice there, all the mainstream churches were taken over by 1980. The reason I believe that that, that was the date that, that was announced they were all taken over was because that was the time that the Seventh-day Adventist Church officially made the Trinity their, their doctrine. We can see there from the illustration on the right, which is an, an Adventist publication, 
um, explaining their belief in the Trinity and the one on the left is a Catholic book. By 1980, by the Seventh-day Adventist Church officially accepting the God of Rome, the Trinity, all the mainstream churches were taken over. Dr. Rivera explained that when he was under the extreme oath of the Society of Jesus, he was told that a secret sign was to be given to the Jesuits worldwide when the ecumenical movement had successfully wiped out Protestantism in preparation for signing of a concordat between the Vatican and the United States. So a secret sign was to be given to the Jesuits all over the world when this takeover had finally happened. What's a concordat, by the way? I looked that up. A concordat is a compact, a covenant, specifically an agreement between a pope and a sovereign or a government for the regulation of ecclesiastical matters. So something happened between the American government accepting and making deals with the Roman Catholic Church. The sign was to be when a president of the U.S. took his oath of office facing an obelisk. Now, for the first time in U.S. history, the swearing-in of ceremonies were moved to the west front of the Capitol, and President Reagan faced the Washington Monument. This happened January 20, 1981. Notice that. That's President Reagan facing west, facing the obelisk. You can see it off in the distance there. In 1981. Just like the secret sign that Alberto talked about was happening, facing an obelisk, facing west. This is going to be significant one in a second. The obelisk is a four-sided pillar facing the four corners of the earth. At its peak, it's a pyramid. It represents a combination of, listen now, both religious and political power worldwide. It appears in Egypt, in the US, and in the Vatican, and also in the city of London, I added. To Jesuits, esoteric masons and the Illuminati, it stands for the one world government. The obelisk represents the sun god Baal. So remember, the Pope's got one as well, just outside his Vatican, the Vatican as we saw that. Now just, just look in history. This is from Wikipedia. Just to see the significance of this changing of the, the direction that the presidents were sworn in at. The first time that the capital was finished, enough to have a wee east and west portico, was 1829. It's the um, Andrew Jackson East Portico, and then you see Martin Van Buren, East Portico, and continues. Abraham Lincoln, the bottom one, East Portico. And you see all these ones, East Portico, up from 1869 to 1905, all East Portico, except for these extraordinary inaugurations that might have been because of the weather or different things. There's no West Portico in any of these, see? East Portico, all of them. Woodrow Wilson, Truman, East Portico. And all the way down, the last one on the East Portico was Jimmy Carter, which was 77, and look look there, the one in red, 1981, the first inauguration of Ronald Reagan, West Front. West Front, the first time in history that happened. Continuing, all, all of these, West Front, West Front, West Front, all the way down to Donald Trump, West Front, except for that one where it was in the rotunda because it was bad weather. Now that is very significant. Everything happens for a reason, and we, we saw the reason why. We saw the reason why. Now take a look at the implications this have in a geographical sense. Here's a map of the world. I chose the Gleason map. I've put stars. See the one in America there down the bottom, the green? That's, the, that's where Washington is. And the other star that on the, towards the right is where Rome is. Can you see they're kind of on a similar latitude? I put a circle in there. You can see it now. They're on a similar latitude. Washington, D.C. is a little bit further south on 38 degrees 89, whereas Vatican's on 41, 54. But they're roughly the same latitude. Prior to the swearing in being moved to the west portico, they both were facing east, which means they would have been looking towards each other's backs as far as if you followed that line around. But look what happens now. When Ronald Reagan flipped around and faced the west, if you follow that latitudinal line, can you see that when the Pope looks out of his balcony towards his Baal sun god image, they're both looking towards each other? As you can see in the picture there on the left, the looking towards the obelisk is looking west and the Pope looking towards his obelisk is looking east and they're going around the world to look into each other. Can you see how the Pope looking at his obelisk in Rome and the American president looking at his obelisk from Washington is forming an image to the beast? It's a reflect. You can see his image reflected back towards himself. Now, what makes this significant, apart from the fact that it's, it's amazing, you know, that, that, that it would be this way, is that Capitol Hill building was 
the cornerstone was laid in 1793. That means they designed it to be orientated this way in 1793, right in the beginning. Right at the beginning, because you, you, you can't orientate a building east west, you know, once you, you, you think about it later and change it. That was there, and you should use the street plans of a, a pentagram, inverted pentagram, all these satanic things. I'm only just showing a little bit of the occult symbology in, in this thing. I, we don't have time to, to go, about, go over all of it. But Rome hijacked America from the Declaration of Independence. That's just that's undeniable when, when you see this evidence for this. And you see all these Roman icons, the fasci eye, the great seal with this Illuminati all-seeing eye. All these speak of, of a coming reunion with Rome that they were bringing about. You know? And again, here we see in the Time magazine, Holy Alliance. Can you see here the American president, the first one to be sworn in, West Portico, is looking, looking at the Pope, with the Pope's, shh, you know. Now listen to me. You see that all the, this is our signal picture. And look at this quote from a Catholic archbishop. 1903, remember, America was a very Protestant country at that time. And how did he know this? When the United States rules the world, the Catholic Church will rule the world. <laughs> because he knew the plan. He knew the plan that was laid far before the Declaration of Independence. You know, the, the way that the United States is an image to the beast, is multifaceted. You know, you can see in architecture not, and, and, and in the soon coming church and state, it's, um, it, was well, it was well planned to be from the beginning. And I believe this strengthens even more our position on this. Next week, we're going to show some more current events from 1980 to present. So um, I invite you all to kneel with me as we, as we close with prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the, the Sabbath. We thank you for your word and... and um, we thank you, Lord, that the, the prophecies we have are so clear and, and, and so accurate and so amazing. We, we are always um, have joy to discover new things. And we pray that um, our hearts might, um, might long for the end of these things. As we see, you know, we know these things are interesting to look at, but when they, when they happen, when they occur, they're going to be also very, very hard times, as, as Jesus wrote. And we just pray as we, as we see the, these days approaching that you'll help us to um, order our lives aright and, um, and, um, and um, consider um, what you would have us to do in these times. And we pray for a blessing on the rest of this Sabbath day. In Jesus' name, amen.